Welcome to the section on calculus-based physics. Now, why would you need calculus in physics? The answer is basically to allow us to handle more complicated situations. At school and before, we've done things like uh, uniform forces, no friction. But the real world, there is friction. Forces are constantly changing. And that's what calculus allows us to handle, more realistic situations. So we're going to be able to show a whole bunch of examples of how much more real-world problems can be addressed by using calculus. Now, the outline for this section of the course, we're going to start off by looking at things that vary with time. So, for example, uh, dropping an object with wind resistance. As it falls, the forces on it will change. So that's an example of something varying with time. Or let's say you've put an ice block out on a hot summer's day and it's cooling down. The rate of cooling depends on the temperature difference between the inside and the outside, and that's changing. So the rate of cooling is also changing. So these are examples of things varying with time. Then we're going to go on to things that vary with space or with position. For example, uh, the pressure inside a star. As you go deeper into the star, the pressure goes up. Uh, how much the pressure goes up depends on the density and the gravity of that place, all of which are changing. So situations like this, uh, where things vary with space, actually are mathematically very much the same as the ones that vary with time. We then get another complication, which is varying with vectors. So what happens if this variation of whatever it is is a three-dimensional thing rather than just a one-dimensional thing? We'll then go on to one particular solution to all these things which is very useful, which is the harmonic oscillator. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, varying vector fields and how to calculate them. So this would be something like trying to work out the electrical magnetic field from some complicated pattern of wires or charges rather than the spherically symmetric case we've dealt with before. Now before I get started, I'd like to give you a general overview of how you go about addressing these sort of problems in real world situations. The first step is always think about the physics. This is surprisingly often forgotten. You'll get fed up with me saying this by the time this course is over. No amount of maths will save you if you don't think about the physics first. The next step is often look at limiting cases. So very often in some situation where things are changing, there will be limiting cases. So for example, when you're dropping something under air resistance, when you first drop it, air resistance is negligible because it's moving very slowly. That's one limiting case. Eventually, it'll reach terminal velocity. When a wind resistance balances gravity, that's another limiting case. And you need the calculus for the intermediate case where they're both important. But it's always vital to think about what those limiting cases are first before getting into all the intermediate complicated stuff. Next, one should estimate the answer. Try and calculate very, very simply, usually in one line of algebra, or one line of numbers, what the answer should roughly be. It's almost always possible to get an answer in a factor of two or three without doing all the complicated bits, and that gives you a crucial check on your understanding of the physics and on the more complicated methods we're going to use afterwards. So then we can get on to the more complicated methods. And there are three choices here. Which one you use in a problem will vary depending on the problem and what sort of accuracy you're after. One method is numerical analysis. This gives you an approximate answer that can be a very, very accurate approximation using step-by-step -step estimations. And we'll talk about how we do this, usually done on a computer, but you can do it on paper. This works all the time and can get you any accuracy you like, but it does require computer time and can be quite expensive. Then you can do it graphically actually plot graphs of the various quantities and estimate things off the graphs. Surprisingly powerful technique and a useful check on the others. And then finally there's calculus. Very nice when it works because it can give you an actual analytic answer. It doesn't often work in practical situations. So these three approaches together will allow you to solve these problems where everything is changing. Okay, so how are we going to work in this course? 
what we're going to do is basically a whole bunch of case studies, of examples. And for each case study, we're going to work all the way through these different steps, thinking about the physics limiting cases estimation, and then these three different methods down here. And hopefully by going over lots and lots of cases, you'll get to see, hopefully some fun examples, you get to see the whole process as it works. And hopefully you get to realize that all these different cases, which seem very different, are actually following exactly the same process.